Let's jump right in here. Page two. History has provided us with many evil rulers who cruelly oppressed their own countrymen. The cruelest ruler, sin, has never existed in flesh and blood, but rather lives within us. So, <laughs> there's, an, there's somebody worse than Adolf Hitler living inside of you. <laughs> what? Yeah. Sin resides in every human being. And that's what this paragraph is saying. The, the worst tyrant ever is not somebody who has held a political office, but somebody who lives right inside of you. Sin is a tyrant and has the potential to oppress and destroy us. Whenever you see, whether it's in the news or you have the opportunity to actually meet somebody who is so out of their mind, so corrupt, so wicked and filthy, never, never forget that it is sin that did that to them. And, you know, the old expression there, but for the grace of God, go I, and we can say that so, so uh, quickly and not even mean it. But the fact is, we are all, because of the presence of sin in us, we are each and every one of us capable of going to those depths. There's not a one of us that's above the most wicked of sins because sin lives inside of us. The great news is that Jesus Christ has delivered us from sin's power through the finished work of Calvary. Praise the Lord. In this lesson, we will learn how we can have freedom from the power of sin. So the first question tonight we're going to answer, what is sin? And we're going to get those answers from the Word of God. Number one, sin is a violation of God's law. Now, before, before you can turn to 1 John chapter 3. We'll get there in a minute. But I think we have a, I think we have a wrong picture of sin. We, have, we see things and actions as sinful. Like if I put a bottle of Budweiser up here tonight and said, um, is that sinful? Well, the answer actually is no. This physical bottle and liquid is not sinful. It's what we do that makes it sinful. Now, I don't want to get into a philosophical question, but I'm just understand that it is the actions we take. And so what we're going to look at here is the defining of these actions. See, we like to point at object, objects and call them sinful so that if we just don't touch those objects, we're good. But the fact is, it's what's in us that is sinful and, and what we do that is sinful and what we say that is sinful. And so we need to understand the concepts that makes sin, sin, and not just be so simple-minded as to say, marijuana, that's a sin. You're, you're missing it. So let's look at what makes things sinful. What is sin? Number one, sin is a violation of God's law. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4. If you're there, you can follow along. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, these are, these are greatly disputed questions, by the way, in Christianity these days. And I don't, I don't want to get into the dispute part of it. But so under grace, if you're walking in the Spirit, 
Galatians, and Galatians, Paul teaches that if you're walking in the Spirit, you will not commit sin. That's why the fruit of the Spirit ends with against such there is no law. If, the, if you were living 100% in the fruit of the Spirit manifested in your life, you would break no laws because there's no laws against love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. That, however, is referring to how the Christian lives in the Spirit. We must not ignore the fact, though, that outside of grace... We sin by breaking God's laws. It's so funny to hear people say they're going to get to heaven. Not funny, it's tragic, but they're going to get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Of course, number one, they can't name them. But number two, just the first one. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Do you think anybody on the planet's living up to just that first one? No, no, we're not. The best Christian doesn't live up to that one. We all have things in our life that are God's to us and that we put before God. So, the fact that we break the law, the law of Moses, as summarized in the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments is what indicates that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. And the law, the Bible says, is our schoolmaster bringing us to Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that the Bible says that when we violate the law of Moses, we are sinning. Let's not debate about, you know, grace and blah, blah, blah. Just understand that fact. When you violate the law of Moses, you are sinning. Turn to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. Now, the wonderful thing about grace is that God has provided remedies for all these things. But that does not mean, yeah, I think I'm just going to go out and rob a bank because uh, I'm not under the law. Well, you're, you're an idiot. And that's the extreme. I know nobody would actually make that statement, but we make that statement about other things. I can do this because I'm under grace. Man, you are so missing the point. Numbers 15, verses 29 and 30. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from his people. Now, to be honest, that's a good example of something that we don't practice. That when someone, because we're not under, this is the covenant between God and the Jewish people. But that doesn't mean that there's not something for us to be learned. From that principle, God does not want his children to sin presumptuously. Presumptuously, hey, I'll tell you what a good good uh, way to explain sinning presumptuously is. I'm going to sin because I know God will forgive me. I think that's what Paul's describing in Galatians 2.21 about frustrating the grace of God. What then, Romans 6, one says, shall we sin? What shall we say then? Shall we, wait, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I know God's grace is going to cover my sin, so let me just go for it. Oh, well, I mean, that's so wicked. And that's, part, that's what presumptuous sin is talking about, Numbers 15. So sin is a violation of God's law. And man, let's praise God to high heaven for his grace. But do not take advantage of God like, well, you're tempting him. Really, that's what tempting God is. That, remember, G, or Satan told Jesus, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. 
God will catch it because the Bible says he shall give his angels. And Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Is it not tempting God to say, I'm going to sin because God's going to forgive me? So sin is a violation of God's law. Number two, sin is missing the mark of de divine perfection. Now, we were in Romans 3.23 Sunday morning. Sin is missing the mark of divine perfection. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We do not live in God's glory. We cannot participate in God's glory. We cannot bring God glory because of our sin. So what is sin? Is it a bottle of beer? Is it a joint? It's certainly, I can show you principle for why engaging in that activity is sinful. But it goes a lot deeper than that. Sin is a violation of God's law. And don't forget, when Jesus applied the law in Matthew 5, he said, you've been taught thou shalt not kill, but I'm telling you, don't even hate a person. So grace doesn't lower the standard. Grace doesn't remove the standard. Grace raises the standard. And he gave a number of examples in Matthew chapter 5. Sin is a violation of God's law. Sin is missing the mark of divine perfection. Number three, sin is described as rebellion. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. And I'll join you there in a second. First, Deuteronomy 9.24. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel. Ye have been rebellious on his, in his farewell speech. Nice, Moses. You're, you're, uh, you're mean. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Sin is described as rebellion. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse number 23. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. You're in Jeremiah. Why don't you turn a few pages back to Isaiah chapter 14, and let's see the original rebellious one. And it's become very popular in the last few decades. And I even, uh, uh, Sapphire the other day sent Amy and me a, a link about a movie that is Magnifying Satan because rebellion has been becoming more and more popular. And I, by the way, I don't mean some evil thing that you, you know, I'm talking about a, a, a it's not a cartoon, but it's like that. I mean, it's something that, that is, uh, I forget the name of it, but it, it's, I don't want to say the name of it anyway. But, and I, I think I told my Sunday school class, she, she sent it to us on a Sunday morning, and uh, I just looked at the, at the trailer, that's all that they, the uh, link was to, but I told my Sunday school class that morning when I told them about the movie that uh, there's a very well-known, sort of a legendary actor in there, and he's quoted, I mean, they, they play a cut of him saying that, uh, no, the devil, devil's a good guy, he's a good guy. And so let's look at this good guy in Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which does weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Satan thought, and by the way, still thinks he can defeat God. He's been trying for at least 6,000 years. And after he's been in hell for 1,000 years, during the kingdom age, he will still come out trying to defeat God, and he will lose. But he still thinks he can do it. But you know what the problem is? When he tempted man to 
be our own gods in Genesis 3. We bought that lie. We still think we can be God. There's places in the depths of your heart where you think you can outsmart God. Where you think, in my heart too, we have places in the depths of our hearts where we think, well, I can do that and God won't really see. Or I know about the whole reap and sow thing, but I'm not really going to reap anything from that. I'm going to go ahead and do that. We think we can outsmart God. We th- and you know what else we think? We think that we can do a better job of running our own lives than God can. We think that we can bring ourselves to a better outcome that God, than God can bring us to. And all of that is the very same rebellion of Satan. And, man, it, it, ought, to, it ought to scare me to death that I should have any of Satan's rebellion in my heart. So sin is described as rebellion. Now, uh, you know Proverbs 3, 5, but let's turn there anyhow, Proverbs 3. Number four, sin is anything that is not faith. Romans 14, 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You say, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty high standard there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So how dare we think that, well, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm a pretty good Christian. I don't really have a sin problem. Just by those four standards, we, we have a sin problem. Proverbs 3, verse number 5, we all know it. Why don't you say it with me? Proverbs 3, 5, ready? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Sin is is not trusting God. It is willful independence. Man, you ponder those four things, and, man, it ought to make all of us just draw closer to God, draw nigh to God. Second big question tonight, and this is where we'll end at the end of this section. Where does sin come from? Where does sin come from? Number one, sin comes from our hearts. Mark 7, verses 21 through 23. For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, which means looseness, moral looseness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Wow. So there's a lot of sin in our heart. That's why Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's all in there. It's all in my heart. It's all in your heart. And so we've got to understand that's where sin comes from. It is natural for man to be sinful. Look at Luke chapter 6, and we'll read verses 43 through 45. Luke chapter 6. Luke 6. 43 through 45. Whoops. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, neither of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. This is very important, especially, and I was raised in a, in a Christian home, and uh, some of you are, uh, were, and some of you have been, and it's when, when you have not been exposed to many of the wickednesses of this world, it's very easy for you to think, yeah, not me, not me. I don't have those things in my, oh, you've got to take God's word for it that you do. You know what the Bible says when it says the way of transgressors is hard? Do you know what a transgressor is? It's somebody who breaks a rule, okay? And the way of the transgressor is hard. Here's why, okay? Somebody says, don't touch that. It's hot. It will burn you. 
and you have to touch it before you believe them. Ah, oh man, you had to do you had to do it the hard way. The way of the transgressor, the guy that's got to touch it to find out if it's hot. That's a hard way to live. And if you can just take God's word for it that no, you have all this wickedness in, in your heart and by the way, if you mess around with this, it'll draw it out. We've been learning on Saturdays about what sin does to your mind. That's what we've been looking at in the men's breakfast. What sin, sin completely reprograms your mind. Now, good things program your mind in a good way, but sin programs your mind in a bad way. It twists your thinking. It distorts your thinking. So if you don't engage in that sin, it won't twist your mind. You will be protected from it. So if you would just take God's word for it, that you have all these things in your heart, the potential is there for you to absolutely destroy yourself right there in your heart. Our heart is the root of our sinful nature. Our behavior is the fruit of our sinful nature. Then page number four, turn to Romans chapter five. Sin is in your heart. Number two, sin is inherited from Adam. Sin is inherited from Adam. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. Many of you can quote this. Let's read it together. It's the last verse that we'll look at tonight. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. And ready? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Our sin natures come from Adam. When Adam chose to sin, his sinless nature became a his sinless nature became a sinful nature. We have inherited Adam's sinful nature. So that answers the question. Where does sin, sin come from? Number one, it comes from our hearts. Number two, it comes, we a sin is inherited from Adam.